Today's topic is congestive heart failure, and the objective of today's webinar are to present the burden of disease of cardiovascular mortality and heart failure, to have an overview of the pathophysiology of heart failure, to characterize important clinical manifestations in the history and physical examination of heart failure patients, to determine ancillary tests that may help in the diagnosis, assessment, and prognostication of heart failure and to review significant strategies in the medical management of heart failure. Today's speaker is Dr. Richard P. Tionko. Dr. Tionko is a graduate of the University of the Philippines College of Medicine. He did his residency in internal medicine and cardiology fellowship at the UPPGH. He has a subspecialty in invasive cardiology. Presently, he is an associate professor at the UP College of Medicine, an assistant training officer of cardiology section in PGH, the head of cardiology fellowship training in research and registry at St. Luke's Medical Center, Global City, and an awardee of the UPMASA for the most outstanding teacher award for the clinic sciences in 2012 and the basic sciences in 2015. Without further ado, May we now call on Dr. Tionko. Thank you, Dr. Jonas. It's a pleasure and a privilege to, to do this uh, webinar for our fellow doctors. We're here today to learn more about optimizing management for heart failure. And uh, I'd like to show my disclosures involvement with the industry. Our objectives, as presented by Dr. Jonas, uh, will not be repeated in the interest of time, we will proceed to the presentation. We know that heart failure is defined as a inability of the heart to function as a pump to adequately produce the different organs in the body. Now this can be due to a number of things which might involve a weakening of the heart in terms of its contractile ability or stiffening of the heart muscles over time that lead it to have pump failure and to the insufficient delivery of blood around the body. Now, patients with heart failure present usually chronically with heart failure symptoms over the months and years, but they can actually be hospitalized frequently over time, in the months, years ahead, and this actually has incremental increase or more frequent increases over a short period of time and over time in the years to come. So truly, we need a lot of uh, good therapies to actually change the course of patients with heart failure. There are two major categories for heart failure. Those with FPEF and those with FREF. You know, as you will see over here, FPEF stands for heart failure with research ejection fraction, and FREF is that with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is usually described and used to be described only as a systolic and diastolic dysfunction. This pertains with ejection fraction or ability of the heart to expel around 35 to 40% or less of the, of the, of the uh, ejection of blood from the heart. Whereas for FPEF, these patients usually have a higher ejection fraction, but still they still present with signs and symptoms of heart failure. And anatomically, there are also differences for which FPEF has thickening of the heart, and that will contribute to the inability of the heart to relax. Whereas for FREF, there's an eccentric hypertrophy of the heart for which there's actually low ratio of mass and volume, causing more dilatation than there is thickness of the heart. As opposed for FPEF, when there's a concentric hypertrophy in remodeling and a higher ratio of mass to volume that of the heart. Now you will see the implications are also with regards to prognostic improvement in the current heart failure therapy for which heart failure with preserved EF is the holy grail for treatment. Now, there's still no core medicines for the treatment of this case. We have symptomatic therapy, but for HEFREF, there are a lot of proven medicines that actually made the headway and proven to reduce mortality. So for the terminologies related to lepidic rejection fraction, to just get us uh, uh, more uh, clear on this matter, when you have F REF, reduce ejection fraction, there's a problem with systole or the ability of the ventricles to contract. Whereas for FF, 
there is a diastolic dysfunction primarily, wherein the heart might be thicker than usual, causing the ventricles to have a problem with relaxation. But either or which, or either or, there will be some amount of reduced or in uh, ejection fraction or ability of the heart to produce the different organs in the body. So we have to know more about heart failure in order to, to treat our patients. And how big is the problem? Well, worldwide, for HFREF and HFF, it is one of the major killers in all societies in the world. The true prevalence, at least for HFF, can be around approximately 5 to 6% of all patients that are seen, whether inpatient or outpatient. And that for HFREF, actually, which is not seen in our slide because it needs added data, will be actually much higher than that. If you look at HFF in, in Japan, the US, and in the Euro Heart failure study, you'll see that a lot of patients seen for total patients assessed, almost half of the patients will present the tech pet. So there's really an underestimated uh, epidemiology for, for this problem. You look at coronary heart disease mortality in the Philippines, and you will see that we are belonging to one of those regions in the world with a high incidence of mortality due to coronary disease. How bad is the problem? We actually rank in the red. Again, with all the major countries with high incidence of coronary heart disease death, we rank number 29 in the world. And you can probably assume also that 40 to 50 percent of all patients die of CHD may have, due, may have heart failure related mortality. Diseases of the heart in finer points in local epidemiology show that 21 percent of patients in the Philippines from 2009 even up to date die of diseases of the heart. So really, uh, the number of deaths due to coronary heart disease and heart disease-related uh, mortality or CHD mortality in the Philippines is truly a big burden in our society. The rates of hospital readmission uh, worldwide is similar for patients that have death and have rep. The mean length of hospital stay increases with in each rehospitalization for heart failure. So this also means for the clinician that every time your patient gets rehospitalized for heart failure, you can probably say to your patient that despite what you do, there seems to be something that has to be done because there is an increased chance of being rehospitalized over the years ahead. Look at this. HFF and HFREF are associated with similarly high levels of mortality over that. The survival rate actually is not any better for HFF than it is for HFREF. And unlike HFREF, survival rates have not improved over time for HFF in finer points regardless of whether you look at 1980s all the way to more current, more current data. Now, it's not all about uh, heart function, you know. Sometimes there's also a psychological impact to the quality of life for patients with heart failure. Patients with heart failure commonly report psychological distress, which means involved depression, hostility, anxiety, uh, uh, lack of uh, self-esteem due to limitation in their activities of daily living, might might uh, influence how they deal with other people at work or, or otherwise in social interaction, and actually might also reduce sexual activity in satisfaction, the ability to carry out such. Now, the etiologies of heart failure can be a uh, myriad of things based on the general literature, but the predominant cause is usually associated with coronary artery disease or atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Next will be hypertension per se, valvular heart disease, and other causes, as we'll see here, like myocarditis, arrhythmia related uh, problems of heart failure, toxicity from substances, which include, yes, long term use of alcohol, a hypo or hyperthyroid, and of course, uh, immune deficiency states like HIV, okay, uh, restricted causes like amyloidosis, radiation. There are a lot, really a lot of uh, number of causes for heart failure. Now, how do we actually work up patients with heart failure? Well, First and foremost, we have to stress that the initial diagnosis of heart failure can be complex. And although it is a clinical diagnosis, patients with the signs and symptoms of heart failure may not always present with heart failure per se or only heart failure upon presentation. That is why, other than having an excellent history and physical exam, which are essential for getting or finishing the diagnosis of heart failure, we need some ancillary tests to actually prognosticate or further evaluate our patients, as we will discuss later on. Now, clinically, 
there are signs that we have to look for in the patients to try to see whether they likely look like they have heart failure. Signs of right-sided heart failure are systemic venous congestion, can present with elevated jugular venous pressure, hepatojugular reflux, that is when you press on the right subcostal area below the liver for around 20 to 30 seconds, and illicit jugular venous distension, hepatomegaly, ascites, or anasarta, or peripheral edema. Patients may have symptoms which pertain to weight gain, increased abdominal girth, and edema. The most common cause of right-sided heart failure or congestion is left-sided heart failure or congestion. For pulmonary venous congestion, this usually alludes to a left-sided uh, presentation of heart failure, which includes symptoms such as dyspnea, shortness of breath, or topnea, paroxysm of nocturnal dyspnea, and cough, among which the most specific symptom in heart failure is paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. For the physical examination, your patients can present with tachypnea, crackles or fine rals rather than coral rals as in contradistinction to pneumonia, pleural effusion, which you will probably show as decreased vocal and tactile premature in the faces, and or pulmonary edema. Now, there are actually clinical criteria for the diagnosis of heart failure. This is called the Framingham criteria. And classically, there are major and minor criteria. Major criteria include paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea or thopnea, elevated JVP, repetitions, a third heart sound, or what's called an S3 gallop, radiological evidence of cardiomegaly, radiological evidence of pulmonary edema, and for minor criteria, as you will see over here. How do you change the diagnosis clinically with high sensitivity and specificity? You will need two major criteria, or one major and two minor criteria. What is important also for the clinicians is that there have been multi variate analysis already on these major criteria. And you know what happened? What came out as the highest correlates in the history or PE? Paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea is the most specific sign, and for the uh, most specific symptom, rather, and the most specific signs are elevated jugular venous pressure and an S3 gallop. We have to prognosticate our patients, and this will depend on the functional class of patients presenting with heart failure. That is why. Worldwide and locally, we also use what's called the New York Heart Association Functional Class. Class 1 is those, are those patients not, with no limitation of physical activity. Ordinary physical activity does not cause heart failure symptoms. Class 2 is light limitation of physical activity. They are comfortable at best, but ordinary physical activity results in symptoms of heart failure. Market limitation of physical activity for class 3. They, have, they are comfortable at rest, but they can only achieve less than ordinary activity to elicit heart failure symptoms. And class four, these are patients who are distinct at rest. It is important to have clinical staging because stage three and stage four heart failure and NYHA functional class carry a poor prognosis over time. Now, a number of diagnostic assessments support the presence of heart failure. And you know, sometimes heart failure can present or be confused with other states like pneumonia or other conditions that can cause dyspnea. Other than having assessment of uh, symptoms and signs by your history and PE, the ECG can actually help us by showing some uh, background data that might allude to the cause of the heart failure, like presence of new or pathological Q waves, which might reflect a new or an old myocardial infarction. In fact, in patients with uh, normal ECG and presenting with heart failure, of course, especially with stomach dysfunction, that is very unlikely to have systolic dysfunction if your ECG is practically normal, but it's not always exclusive or always the case. Laboratory analysis, some can aid in treatment and diagnosis like your brain natriuretic peptide and your NP pro BNP, and looking at some other general laboratory workup like hyponatremia, which is usually dilution on the setting of heart failure. If your patient can have elevated uh, creatinine or decreased EGFR, renal dysfunction, mild elevations of troponin acutely or chronically can also be present in heart failure. The checks x-ray might show butterfly pattern or congestion, showing pulmonary venous congestion, or curly B lines as such you will see in your x-rays. Echocardiography is one of the most sensitive and specific cardiac function, and to further elaborate on cardiac anatomy. So signs and symptoms of FPF are similar to FPF, and remember, these are the key things that you have to look for in signs and symptoms for both your ST gallop and not to mention your drug events extension, signs of pulmonary congestion, edema, and 
hepatomegaly. For HEFPEH, unfortunately, it is not always an easy uh, diagnosis. It can be actually confused or actually uh, confounded by a number of disorders that may present in a similar manner. Uh, valvular disease, uh, uh, obesity, masses in the heart, like atrial myxoma, and other conditions of the heart may not actually be um, uh, 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 e easily diagnosed. They might actually need further evaluation by other tools. That is why we need additional tests in heart failure, not only to have uh, further testing or prognostication, but to further elaborate or look or evaluate our patients for other conditions that might actually show us why this patient is as such and how is the patient right now. This will include uh, workup with your complete blood count, and of course you want to look if your patient is anemic or having any infections in the setting of comorbidities like pneumonia, looking at this other system, so your creatinine, BUN, electrolytes, you want to know their state at this point, you can correct them. Passing blood sugar and lipid profile to check them screen for diabetes and uh, dyslipidemia, liver function tests or liver dysfunction tests as you would call it, your SGPT, SGOP, or ASTLT to check for CPC of the liver and sometimes people do the rubrics to look at your uh, child score or liver function. TSH at times but not always uh, in the setting of patients that you suspect for thyroid disorders and of course a good tool to screen for coronary artery disease will be an ECG. Okay, so echocardiography as you noticed, uh, as we know also is a sensitive and specific measure to look at ventricular size, function, look in the setting of HFREF or HFPEF, how we can actually tolerate the presentation of the patient looking at wall thickness, wall motion, and valve motion. A very important tool in assessing a patient with heart failure. Other uses in heart failure, of course, for echocardiography will involve the ventricular volume and systolic function determination. Morphology and relative sizes of the cardiac chambers can be determined. The systolic function can be actually ramped or measured. And you can actually estimate pressures in the heart, such as that for the right side. What do we do with um, more tests, no? like brain arteriotic peptide or NTPO-VNP, which are sometimes locally and internationally? You can actually use brain arteriotic peptide, which is elevated by, due to atrial stretching of your uh, patients with heart failure, and they will actually have very high BNP or NT, BNP, BNP here. And when you see this in patients, heart failure diagnosis is very likely. So what are the primary reasons why you would want to do BNP? If it should or can be done, diagnosis of heart failure in patients with dyspnea when there are probably other confounding presentations such as uh, pneumonia or what, you know, we're not sure about the diagnosis. Number two, to prognosticate and risk gratify our patients. Number three, to screen for chronic heart failure in high-risk patients, monitoring and guiding therapy. And of course, locally, this might be a, a practical challenge for Filipino patients. And the treatment with the combinant BNP or what we'll see the net realizing inhibitors later on. For HEPPE, it is a little bit of a challenge because other than correlating your signs and symptoms with tests like your DNP and your 2D echo, this will need further evaluation, particularly for local practice. In the general no uh, nomenclature, HEF-PEF is for patients with EF more than 50%, HEF-REF is for EF less than 40%, and they test in the last couple of years, there is a new prognostic uh, group called hef -MEF. These include patients with 40 to 50% ejection fraction, and the worst type of HEFMEF patients are those with diastolic dysfunction. What is the evolution of treatment for patients with heart failure? The evolution is actually a dynamic one over time because we're learning to know more about medicines, but we also need to validate them for future use. And pharmacologically, we tell our patients to fluid restrict themselves because more fluid every day will cause the heart to swell or become bigger and that will be more congestion for the patient and worse uh, ability of the heart contract. You know, if you remember the Starling's principle, you know, Frank Starling's principle, if your patient has a big heart, that's a failing heart, it will be more effort for a stretched out heart to contract over a given volume over time. Now, patients also are given uh, additional advice to have sodium restriction, and of course, five to six grams per day is actually a lot of uh, leeway. We try to get our patients around less than or equal to two grams actually per day, but it's easier said than done. Alcohol, which is actually one of the 
reasons for non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. But there are patients to actually limit this also. They uh, more in women actually rather than men, as you will see. A diet rich in fruits, vegetables, low fat dairy products are important. And you have to get your patients to their ideal body weight below uh, BMI of 25. You'll see there are other goals of per circumference and exercise, likewise important, because it can actually improve cardiac performance, and we'll discuss it later on. There's no such thing as telling a patient to cut down on smoking. You have to tell them to stop smoking, or smoking cessation is very important. How do we treat patients, and what are the best medicines for treating heart failure? What is key or central in the treatment of patients with heart failure is inhibition of the renin angiotensin and aldosterone axis. And you will see that there are actually some key areas that we have to target for therapy that for which ACE inhibitors are known to block are your ACE inhibitor. Now, your ACE inhibitors block angiotensin converting enzyme in the lungs. They prevent further conversion of your angiotensin 1 to angi angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2, uh, if ever it is unabated or not uh, modulated, will continue to stimulate the bad receptor, angiotensin 2 type 1 receptor, which causes vasoconstriction, sodium retention, indirect sympathetic nervous system activation, inflammation, activation of protein kinase, that's why your heart and your vascular media become thick, and will promote release of aldosterone, causing sodium and water retention and apoptosis of your cells in the media and your heart. Whereas there is another good uh, receptor, angiotensin 2 type 2 receptor, which actually, if allowed to be stimulated further by angiotensin 2, will cause opposite or good hemostatic or hemostatic um, properties or physiology. So, what do we do? There are possible targets, and you see the ACE inhibitors inhibit your angiotensin converting enzyme here, but your ARBs don't prevent angiotensin, angiotensin 2 from forming the block at the receptor level. At the 81 receptor, the effects of angiotensin 2. And if you modulate the bad effects of angiotensin 2, you can actually indi indirectly uh, improve the bad effects of oxidative stress, inflammation, tissue remodeling, and endothelial dysfunction. Okay? And that will also mean indirectly modulating an, an antidiuretic hormone secretion, causing further water retention, and the fibrotic effects of aldosterone on your heart and blood vessels. Okay. So overaction of the RAS is very uh, bad, and we need to actually improve medical therapy. Otherwise, we actually will get target organ damage. And in this case, unabated angiotensin 2 will cause target organ dysfunction, not only for the heart, for kidneys, you can get stroke, hypertension, and death. Okay. Now, targeted therapy will probably involve, or is going to involve, RAS suppression which is an effective strategy in treating heart failure. And you can see multiple points for which your drugs or RAS blockers, known as your ACE inhibitors or your ERBs work upon. And at the, at the end of the day, you'll have less fibrosis and less hypertrophy of the heart, decrease in sympathetic nervous system activation, decrease in sodium water retention, okay, and decrease in your peripheral vasoconstrictive effects and hypertrophy of the media and less vasopressin response, as we had indicated a while ago. So that is why, in terms of targeted drug therapy, historically, landmark studies have been launched after small studies. The landmark studies have shown, all the way from the 90s, the importance of RAS blockers and other ancillary medicines that have shown to improve hard cardiovascular endpoints, not only to improve uh, minor endpoints or lesser endpoints like symptomatology, and hospitalization, we'll handle them one by one. SOLD, actually, which is a trial on ACE inhibition, one of the key or cornerstone uh, citations for ACE inhibition, using enalapril up to a maximum of 20 to 40 milligrams twice a day, with an average dose of around 17 to 18 milligrams per day in patients with HEF-REP, showed significant relative risk reduction as early as, look at this, Kaplan Meyer, almost one month from therapy, and this effect actually carried all the way to the many months after therapy with a 16% relative risk reduction. That is on top of standard medical therapy. And of course, this study was done all the way back in 1991. That's why ACE inhibitors for almost 20 plus years have been a mainstay in treatment of patients with f -red. Beta blockers are key medicines because beta blockers actually change what is inherently problematic in heart failure patients. In heart failure patients, that's why they're also hypersympathetic is because they have beta receptor down-regulated. When you give patients 
gradual dose is a beta blocker over time to their maximum dose. There's upregulation of those receptors. There's improved cardiac remodeling, and your patients get that bullet chip, good looking heart, as they ought to have in the trials, such as the CBIS. In the CBIS, not only that happened, all cause mortality actually improved. The survival rate of patients dramatically improved. Even only after a few days, the patients already reached the benefits of survival in patients on beta blockers. The charm actually showed, just like other studies for uh, certain uh, ARBs, in this case, candesartan improved mortality morbidity in patients with HEFREP, showing that ARBs probably don't stay in the shadows of just being given for patients with uh, cough uh, due to ACE inhibitors, but they probably deserve a little bit more attention or maybe respect with regards to their use in heart failure knowing that some studies like this show or also early in dramatic improvements in patients who cannot be on ACE inhibitors. Child alternative actually shows us that ACE inhibitors have a role on top of standard therapy in reducing mortality and morbidity. When you use a patient, uh, when you give a patient rather an ARB on top of an ACE inhibitor, that's like in the CHARM added study. And in some cases, the really sick patients with RAS activation, SNS activation, Patients who are with heart failure, candesartan reduced by 15%, again, very early. They reduced cardiovascular mortality and hospitalization in patients with HEFREP. Modern studies, or like in the last eight years, showed new or novel, novel drugs like chronic current inhibitors, like for example, Gabapradine, given at its maximum dose, 7.5 milligrams twice a day. They actually uh, showed in the study, in the SHIFT study, significant early reductions in cardiovascular mortality and hospitalization for worsening heart failure in patients with HEFREP. The RAL study showed that mineral corticoid receptor antagonists, just like your aldosterone blockers, like spironolactone, reduced also mortality and morbidity in HEFREP. And newer studies like your emphasis heart failure in efleronone, MRAs with efleronone, actually also showed likewise reductions in your uh, um, heart failure related mortality and hospitalization. So there you have it. These are the core medicines for improving survival and getting your patients out of the hospital. And in this slide, probably you can add your M your MRAs, your I don't mean. Now there are actually there's a need for more therapeutic advances in HEP -TEP. There's still no uh, cornerstone drug for therapy for HEP -TEP. HEP -TEP, rather. Charm preserved no benefit for cancer sartan in significant for reducing morbidity and mortality in FPEP. Top cat looking at spironolactone even up to a maximum dose of 45 milligrams per day. There's no significant benefit, and you see the P value is 0.14. There's a trend towards benefit, but it's not significant. Carvedilol in patients with FPEP, likewise, no significant improvement. Uh, spironolactone, again, in a separate study, the ALDO HF, likewise, still no not, uh, remarkable improvement. There are experimental studies or several ongoing studies for, the, for therapy in patients with HEFPEP, and we probably have to uh, talk about it some other time when the studies are all done. So if you compare the studies also for HEFPEP versus HEFREP, you know that HEFREP has a really big, uh, uh, large uh, pool of database or uh, good randomized controlled trials, large ones at that, to help us decide what would be the best therapeutic strategies. But for HEFPEP, there's actually um, one of actually large uh, effective uh, therapies, uh, large studies that actually need to be done because mostly in mechanistic studies in non-definitive trials are present. Now, uh, there's a new molecule um, that is actually being posed as a uh, uh, improvement for heart failure, and these are called your angiotensin receptor inhibitor nephrodizing inhibitors, or the ARNIs. The concept is you try to make the nephrodizing you try to make your BNP work better by degrading the enzyme that inhibits BNP and at the same time block the RAS, but at this time using a uh, angiotensin receptor blocker. So before that, we elaborate on that. Uh, let's look at the treatment objectives for a patient with chronic heart failure. Okay? The objectives are, of course, we want to reduce mortality, reduce morbidity, and you can actually see here, you want to relieve patient signs and symptoms, improve quality of life, and there are other uh, in the interest time, I'll just have, I'm sure you can read this. Uh, these are actually very important objective, uh, treatment objectives for chronic heart failure. And 
there are actually stages of heart failure that need appropriate therapy. In patients with multiple risk factors or at risk for heart failure, you will see there are some general goals for therapy and drugs, ACE or ARP, in appropriately in appropriate patients for vascular disease or diabetes may be indicated in patients known as stage B structural heart disease but without signs and symptoms of heart failure. All the therapeutic goals in, in stage A ought to be done. Drugs, ACE or ARP in appropriate patients, beta blockers in appropriate patients. And some patients were at high risk for mortality in, in patients with, uh, of course, we will be discussed very reactor later on, uh, defibrillators or ICDs. Stage C are those patients with structural heart disease with prior occurred symptoms of heart failure. All of those measures in uh, stage A and B. Drugs for routine use or ideal use would be your diuretics for fluid retention, ACE inhibitors or beta blockers. And in select patients, you will see as uh, aldosterone blockers, ARBs, digitalis, hydrogen and nitrates. And in select patients, by ventricular pacing and defibrillators. And for patients with stage D, these are the hardest to treat patients with refractory heart failure. All of those measures, and unfortunately, they might need more than that other than cardiac rehab. They might need an assist device or an LVAD, and they might actually end up having heart transplant if it at all can be done and where. Most patients with chronic heart failure should be routinely managed with a combination of a RAS blocker, a beta blocker, and a diuretic. And of course, the first thing to do is decongest the patient and start your RAS blockers and eventually your beta blockers in succession. And usually this takes a titration of around two to three weeks in patients who are relatively stable. Diuretics are recommended for relief of dyspnea and edema in patients with heart failure, irrespective of heart ejection fraction. And the aim of diuretic therapy is to achieve and maintain euvolemia. That's why weighing a patient every day is one of the best things that you can do to monitor your patient in terms of efficacy of treatment using the lowest possible dose of diuretics. Some patients will need IV diuresis. Some patients will need oral diuresis. Of course, the more congested patients will need IV diuresis and might need sometimes to a trip. Loop diuretics produce more intense and shorter diuresis than a thiazide diuretic. So we prefer loop diuresis for congestive heart failure patients. So what are novel core therapies in heart failure? One molecule, which is registered as an LCZ696, which is already available in the Philippines, tries to actually improve, if not challenge, the modern thinking or the current paradigm of treating patients with heart failure. We know that we have to block sympathetic nervous system activation, modulate or inhibit too much RAS stimulation. But what about your natriuretic peptides? We sometimes read this in the book. Is there any therapeutic value to try to get this into the arm of treating patients with heart failure? It is uh, one of the neurohormonal systems that can actually be tapped in the treatment of heart failure. This is where your ARNIs come in. Natriuretic peptides are actually doing a lot of things physiologically, but they cannot work that much if there's a lot of RAS stimulation. So what is done is actually to try to design a drug that will inhibit the breakdown of your natriuretic peptides by this enzyme called nephrilysin, and try these natriuretic peptides work on the receptors that will improve vasodilation, modulate protein kinase C. That's why you will not get it, that much uh, vascular or ventricular hypertrophy, anti-apoptosis or anti-proliferation. All these benefits are hypothetically so if you actually allow the natriuretic peptides to work. It does not work as it is no, uh, efficiently because RAS actually blocks the efficacy of your natriuretic peptides. So if you let your RAS uh, be without it being blocked, you'll have unabated vasoconstriction, cardiac fibrosis and hypertrophy because angiotensin 2 is the most potent vasoconstrictor and modulator for the pathophysiology of heart failure. So having said that, you have to actually design a drug that will try to prevent nephrolysin from from working too much in degrading your natriuretic peptides and at the same time block your RAS so that it can work. One design of a drug is called LCZ696, which is a nephrolyzing inhibitor with a name called sacubitril, combined with another molecule, which is, a, which is an ARB known as Balsartan. <laughs> and this actually registered as a single molecule known as an ARNI. Now what happens is that if you give LCZ696, not only do you block nephrolysin, which increases the, pharm the pharmacodynamic response of your natriuretic, inherent natriuretic peptides on the receptors, it will actually block your, your AT1 by the, by the other molecule valsartan, thereby modulating successfully, supposedly, or at least hypothetically, 
this arm in RAS stimulation. So um, what to expect is supposedly the enhancement of vaso relaxation, all the physiologic effects that you will see here on this slide, reducing aldosterone levels, also fibrosis, hypertrophy, and increasing natiuresis. Whereas RAS, RAS blockade with your uh, valsartan will, will try to decrease vasoconstriction and hypertrophy and fibrosis also. So you can actually read this in contradistinction to older failed uh, ER and I homopathy that which called severe angioedema in, in, in initial testing, it did not it did not carry over as a successful therapy. But ER and I, after the phase one and phase two studies showed negligible angioedema and, and if it were present very nominal compared to what was experienced with homopathy that it was not uh, life threatening at all. So LCC 696, in summary, uh, you get this, and actually in the paradigm HF study, it was shown to actually reduce mortality as compared to your inadequate, which is given at around 19 milligrams average dose. And that's another discussion. In the interest of time, we'll try to summarize what we talked about in terms of the treatment of arterial, and what better way than look at uh, collegiate or actually guideline-based recommendations. So in the ESC guideline, which just came out uh, a few months ago in May 2016, May, all patients with heart failure ought to be started on a diuretic initially from beginning to end not to try to relieve symptoms and signs and symptoms of congestion and if their EF is less than 35 percent despite optimal medical therapy or a history of symptomatic BD or VF, no? then of course uh, implantable ICD might be a consideration that will be discussed by our reactor in a while. Patients with symptomatic hep breath you are given a grade one of recommendation to start with an ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker. Historically, and based on large volume of pooled data, good randomized control trials, large ones at that, they are still the leaders at the front line in therapy, as we see in this recommendation. But if your patient is still symptomatic with a low EF of less than 35%, you add your spironolactone and or your, or your epilerinone. And if, yes, they're still symptomatic with an EF less than 35 able to, to tolerate an Eastern ERB for protocol, just in like your paradigm, par paradigm heart failure, you start your ER and I, your RNA to replace your ACE inhibitor. If your patient has some sinus rhythm with a QR restoration of more than equal to 130 milliseconds, you evaluate the need for cardiac resynchronization therapy. This might actually improve cardiac function, which may dis be discussed in a while. In your patients with sinus rhythm with a heart rate of more than 70, just like in the shift study, I grab a bean, the funny current inhibitor on top of standard therapy. All of these are horizontally recommended side by side. You don't need to substitute them, as you will see here. These above treatments may be combined, if indicated, in patients who are still symptomatic despite optimal medical therapy down the line. And for resistance symptoms, well, that is where your digoxin, isenhydralazine, or l or heart transplantation will come in. So it is also important to treat the comorbidities or give particular attention to comorbidities. COPD, you have to attend to that, give appropriate therapy, and uh, that's non-pharmacologic and pharmacological, treat your hypertension, attend to renal dysfunction, and appropriate care of diabetes are likewise important. One of the important uh, things that you can get from cardiac rehabilitation is uh, cardiac rehab is reduced hospitalization, improved hemodynamics, and less mortality over time. It also improves a patient's ability to return to work and get back to social activity, improves their confidence no? and their ability to deal with stress and anxiety. And probably last, not, but not last but not the least is uh, the advice regarding vaccination. Okay, and well, patients with heart failure, uh, they, have, they have poor perfusion. They need cardiac rehab, they have something to improve their immune system. Okay, so we have to recommend influenza vaccination, uh, uh, ideally probably the quadrivalent type annually. Vaccination every five years. Particularly, you look at this in terms of age, particularly for those patients who are more than 18 to 65 years old. So, I guess it brings us to the end of our uh, webinar, but uh, uh, we'll just have a few conclusions before we proceed. Heart failure uh, is a major burden for mortality mobility and hospitalization locally and worldwide. Heart failure is either HEFF or HEFREF, but both share common clinical presentations. Heart failure diagnosis is clinically based and can be further evaluated with ancillary exams for prognostication. And the core medicines for heart failure include ACE inhibitors or ARDs, beta blockers, there is spironolactone, panic current channel inhibitors, and the latest core medicine for HEFREF 
it's LCC 696, that's a very robust high time, it's a Kupitel, and hopefully uh, we can probably validate this uh, medicine also locally in, uh, in further studies. Cardiac rehab programs and appropriate vaccinations are recommended for further improvement of outcomes in heart failure management. So I guess it brings, uh, brings to, to an end my part of the discussion. Uh, maybe I can bring the mic back to Dr. Jonas. Thank you for that insightful lecture, Dr. Kyonko. We would like to thank today's sponsor, Novartis, and our media partners, the Philippine Daily Inquirer, and the Filipino Doctor. Before we proceed to our Q&A portion, let me introduce to you our guest panelist, Dr. Giselle Herbasho. Dr. Herbasho is a graduate of the University of the Philippines College of Medicine, she did her residency in internal medicine at the UPPGH and did her subspecialty training in clinical cardiac electrophysiology and pacing in Indiana University, Cranert Institute of Cardiology in the United States. She is currently a clinical associate professor at the UP College of Medicine, the training officer at the cardiovascular section of PGH, and the head of the electrophysiology section of St. Luke's Medical Center in Global City. She is also the Vice President of the Philippine Heart Vision Society. May we now call on Dr. Giselle Herbacho. Thank you, Jonas. Congratulations, Ricky. That was quite a comprehensive lecture on congestive heart failure. And uh, rightly so that we should give it that much attention because we all know that CHF is becoming somewhat of an epidemic worldwide and even locally here in the Philippines. And this was supported by the local as well as international data shown by Ricky. And uh, one of the uh, more important points I picked up from your lecture is the under-recognition of diastolic heart failure, as we used to call it, but now it goes by heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Under-recognized because a, a physician will often ask for a, an echocardiogram and having a documented normal ejection fraction will sort of write off heart failure as the diagnosis. But now, slowly, we are recognizing that there is a significant chunk of patients who belong to this category. And uh, ancillary tests like the pro-BNP and the BNP, the cutoffs 100, 400, and 4,000, are what might help swing the diagnosis for or against heart failure. In addition, there are special studies uh, during echocardiogram, the strain, the strain measurements, which might confirm the presence of diastolic dysfunction. Unfortunately, for diastolic heart failure, aside from salt limitation and perhaps some diuresis, there is little evidence for drugs, drugs that help alter its course. So that is where there is still a big, big knowledge gap at the moment. As for systolic heart failure, or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, there are decades of data and experience as, as to its diagnosis and its treatment. Uh, Ricky has very aptly summarized all the data, both historical and current, and uh, the current one is very interesting, the use of the ARNI, because it seems to show a power that is almost compar or actually comparable to ACE, in ACE inhibitors and significantly adds to our armamentarium for heart failure, heart failure treatment. Now, I would also like to add some uh, therapies, adjunctive therapies for heart failure because whether we like it or not, we have not really done very well as far as treating it or reversing it completely is trying to control it and to prolong survival, to improve symptoms, but not really cure. So these adjunctive therapies are likewise therapies to support or to improve the patient's uh, status, but not really to cure. So the first uh, adjunctive treatment is cardiac resynchronization therapy. Uh, if you would like to picture it, it's like a triple chamber pacemaker. And the purpose of the three wires in there are to resynchronize or retime a heart that is in failure and is not pumping in a, coordinate, in a coordinated fashion. 
So how do you identify? Not everyone will benefit from this triple chamber pacemaker. So who are those candidates? Well, obviously, they have to be severe heart failure patients, and that is an ejection fraction of less than or equal to 35% despite opti optimal medical therapy. And we are doing this to improve symptoms and reduce morbidity and mortality. But the most important pickup criterion is that the QRS needs to be widened. The clear benefit is among those who have at least 150 milliseconds and left bundle branch block. Although there are incrementally less benefits in those that have not as wide QRSs and different patterns of IBCD. It has also been shown to still be useful. In fact, it's a class 2A recommendation if the patient has all those uh, low EF, heart failure on optimal, optimal medical therapy, but there's already an atrial fibrillation. So these uh, guidelines taken from the European guidelines, which Ricky presented earlier, help us determine the strength of evidence for CRT. So again, it is adjunctive therapy. If you already are on optimal medical therapy, patient is still uh, dyspneic and symptomatic, patient has a wide QRS, and is in sinus rhythm or in atrial fibrillation. Now the next adjunctive therapy is an ICD. ICD stands for implantable cardioverter defibrillator therapy. And this has been around for the last two and a half decades. What it is basically is like a pacemaker, except that it has the ability to treat ventricular arrhythmias, either through pacing or through defibrillation. Now, obviously, it is most beneficial if the patient with heart failure has already had uh, ventricular arrhythmias or resuscitated sudden cardiac death. That is a very strong indication for putting in the ICD. But now, it is now used for primary prevention. When we say primary prevention, it means the patient has a weak heart but has not manifested with any arrhythmias. Now, why would you do that? Uh, the reason is uh, those with low ejection fractions have a very severe disease in their heart such that the likelihood of developing a ventricular arrhythmia in the future is high. This is especially true for patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy, where huge islands of scar from old myocardial infarctions serve as a substrate around which a reentrant arrhythmia may, may uh, develop. The evidence is less strong for dilated cardiomyopathy because here the disease process is more diffuse, the scarring is microscopic, so the substrate is not as uh, as compelling as that for ischemic cardiomyopathy. So nonetheless, the bottom line is that an ICD is put in uh, either as secondary prevention or as preventive, purely preventive therapy, primary prevention, among patients with severely uh, depressed ejection fractions to extend their survival and to decrease the risk of sudden cardiac death. Now, some caveats is you should not put it in uh, too early after an MI. You want remodeling to occur first because you want to be able to assess the ejection fraction after the remodeling has, has happened. And second is you should have corrected everything, everything, ischemia, electrolyte dysfunction, thyroid dysfunction, before you commit the patient to an ICD. And last is the patient should at least have one year survival remaining for it to be cost effective. Okay, now the last two slides have to do with atrial fibrillation. And atrial fibrillation is, uh, is specifically prevalent among patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And that is understandable because the stiff left ventricle muscles increase the intraatrial pressure, which uh, stretch out the electrical system in the atria, thus leading to atrial fibrillation. And uh, we know that uh, a lot of people would prefer rate control over rhythm control just because they are more comfortable with AV node blocking agents. However, this table is telling us that in uh, cases where the patient is already hemodynamically compromised, 
there are other treatments that need to be considered, such as cardioversion, electrical cardioversion. If the patient is in frank heart failure, heart rate running so fast, or is having angina, then you must consider electrical conversion. Other uh, agents that might be given in a more aggressive fashion, uh, fashion IV amiodarone. You can use IV amiodarone for rate control when the patient is already in frank acute heart failure. Beta blockers, you use it once the patient has been pulled out of congestion, and Ricky did point out the, the mecha mechanisms by which beta blockers uh, help the heart failure status. Dig adjunctive, not, not very, uh, it's an additional medication if the beta blocker and amiodarone don't work because it can be overridden by the effect of high sympathetic tone. Now, AV node ablation as part of the long-term therapy, that's a second-line treatment. If you've given all the medical treatment and the rates are running very fast and you, you feel that the high heart rates are contributing to the continuation of the CHF, then that may be considered along with a permanent pacemaker. Now, lastly, we would like to emphasize the importance of anticoagulation. Remember that congestive heart failure patients, per se, are at higher risk for stroke just because of the stasis that exists in the heart in someone with a low ejection fraction. And there are uh, scoring systems. The most current one is the chance vest congestive heart failure, hypertension, uh, arterial atherosclerosis, diabetes, uh, previous history of stroke, and vascular vascular conditions, a score of at least two uh, indicates a risk of 3% of, or higher of stroke. And the has bled is the scoring to assess bleeding. And you balance, sort of balance the risk and the benefit. So patients with valvular AF, if there's a concomitant uh, valve problem, primary valve problem, should be treated before for it. While those that have heart failure and non-valvular AF may be treated with NOAX. NOAX stands for Novel Oral Anticoagulation, no longer called NOAC anymore because they're, not, they're no longer novel. So uh, basically, uh, just uh, to point out that anticoagulation should never be forgotten because, the, because of the catastrophic consequence of the stroke. So, uh, those are my comments. Thank you for that very <clears throat> insightful reaction, Giselle. Uh, we have about three to five minutes for to answer your questions, so feel free to type in or text your questions. Um, I am a pediatric cardiologist, and looking at the, the medications, including some other adjunctive treatment that you give your adult patients, uh, I wonder about uh, one compliance because there seems to be quite a number of medications that they have to take especially if their heart failure is probably more advanced and secondly I'm also worried about the cost of this uh, recommendations and in the Philippine setting I think one important limitation is uh, how do we maintain this treatment because they're quite costly so how do you try to balance or prioritize treatment in your clinical practice. Yes, that's that's truly a specter of a problem in our society, especially if we have challenges with uh, social equity. Uh, if, we, if our patients uh, cannot get um, access to medicines, that's one. Number two is uh, ability to purchase the medicines if not our government can get them. Some of the medicines actually are quite um, expensive, if you want to put it that way. And it will be a, really a Beautiful idea if you can actually incorporate it, like in, for example, you know, or some socialized form of uh, medical management. Some tablets might actually cost more than 100 pesos twice a day. Some 60 pesos twice a day. And like you said, polypharmacy might so be something, uh, nothing unusual to for patients with heart failure because we have to target multiple mechanisms. RAS blockade might take two or three medicines, ancillary medicines like beta blockers, etc., another couple of medicines. So, it's really a challenge to treat patients. How do we do it? Well, it might be called a compromise for some. That, that might mean 
some people look at and how do you actually get more pertanthemine to get uh, the best uh, medicines? Um, how do you have to get the better access to medicines? These, are all, these, these all have to be addressed. Really a challenge. Um, has any guidelines coming from the Philippine Heart Association just to tailor fit the recommendations, let's say, coming from ESC or yeah. ACC, just so that it's probably more relevant or applicable okay. to our sense? That's a very important question because in the last five to seven years, uh, novel, novel therapies like fibrocadine and uh, LCC 696 just came up. So, uh, the last CED guidelines was like 2014, not so long ago. But uh, it takes time for uh, for things like this to occur. So, so you have to give. Yeah. So the Council on Heart Failure, Doctor Ibenet, I'm not sure if you're there. Well, you have to uh, look into this. My my question is for Giselle. Uh, clearly, it seems like and there's already a nice literature uh, on, on the advantage of the CRT, and now you're also saying that ICD sort of like. Uh, Primary prevention uh, has this been embraced in, in our medical community? Are there a lot more people coming in now for CRT and then ICD placement? Uh, there's a growing number, I would say. I mean, these are costly devices, but especially for CRT, the response is sometimes so dramatic that uh, patients who are who, have, who were previously debilitated are able to resume some sort of normalcy. In their lives, there are super responders where the ejection fraction normalizes. Is there a certain subset? Of yes, thirty percent. Thirty percent are the super responders, and seventy percent <laughs> is the overall response rate. Unfortunately, it's not even close to hundred percent because I think we have to select patients better. But uh, the ways I see where it may uh, increase the, comp the compliance rate may increase is. As Ricky mentioned, if the, if the universal insurance pays for it, then it becomes available to everyone. And the Philippine Heart Rhythm Society is, uh, has, am among its advocacies, uh, trying to get this covered by Philippine. To be a standard of care. To be a standard, standard of care. Because right now it's still out of pocket, and the charity patients have to go through charitable organizations to have it. And Dr. Jones, I may add, with regards to the problem on FF, there's really no core medicine as yet. But I do believe that the LCC 696, there's an ongoing study called Paragon, to try to see if this molecule can actually work including LV geometry and heart health thomas. That might come up in a few to five years. Am I right to assume that the sooner we can treat heart failure with reserve ejection fraction, some of these newer therapies, the better it will be because now they don't have to end up like going into yes, the they other. Yes, well, hypothetically, if you modulate uh, the reasons why your patient is having a stiff benefit and eventually having the day presentations of heart failure, modulating LB John actually change the destiny of the patient's course. At least, that is the hypothesis being examined by the study for the CC696. And this is my last question. Looking at the literature in the U.S. and in Europe, is there any particular unique baseline for athletics of Filipinos? You know, it's the same thing. It's still cardiovascular mortality. Is there something in our culture, in the way that we eat, maybe, or how we, you know, that we dispose Filipinos to have like a heart failure more than the others, or it's basically the same? Banana? Well, our local epidemiology shows a really increase, uh, stark increase in the trends of diabetes, hypertension. We actually genetically have low HDL, whether that's due to increased clearance of your HDL molecules or just genetically lower production of efficient HDL. And are you seeing more and more younger patients going to heart failure? Because of um, the um, vaccines, uh, drugs, so uh, diabetes. Lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Speaking of lifestyle, uh, the MS trial showed that a big chunk of men, Filipino men, are smokers. Still. Still. Still, still smokers. Smoking is the number one. Yeah. Oh, yes. And a big chunk of Filipino women are obese. So I think we can improve on that. Mm -hmm. More Sumba classes for the women? Yeah. Yes, yes. Because the and men have basketball, the women should have some. <laughs> right? Zumba. Zumba. All right.
So um, thank you for that engaging discussion, Isen and Ricky. I think uh, our time is up. So to summarize, we learned that heart failure is a major burden for morbidity, mortality, and hospitalization locally here in our country and worldwide. Heart failure is either heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, uh, FPEP, or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, but both share common clinical presentations. Heart failure diagnosis is clinically based and can be further evaluated with ancillary exams for prognostication. The four medicines for heart failure include ACE inhibitors, the angiotensin receptor blockers, the beta blockers, diuretics, specifically spironolactone and blue diuretics, um, concurrent channel inhibitors, ivabridin. Um, the latest core medicine for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is a nephrolysin inhibitor. My first time to, to hear this, it's balsartan plus sacrobitril. There's still no core medicine for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Uh, ancillary treatment uh, includes uh, control of arrhythmia and um, also anticoagulation. Part of rehab programs and appropriate vaccinations are recommended to further improve outcomes in heart failure management. After this session, an email containing a survey link will be sent to you. After answering the survey, your certificates will be sent to you. Please answer the survey so we can assess our webinar and address more of your preferences and give you materials from this session. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again. We would also like to thank our sponsor, No Workies, and the Philippine Daily Inquirer, and the Filipino Doctor for their support as our media partners. We hope to see you again in our upcoming webinar on October 12th, Wednesday, same time, 12 noon to 1 p.m. Manila time, with speaker Dr. Salvation Chayan and Dr. Nina Verba on dengue awareness and prevention. Please invite your colleagues to join this continuing, continuing monthly CME web, webinar series. All webinar schedules and resources will be posted at our Facebook page, UP Med and Webinars. You may also subscribe to our mailing list as posted. You may also email us at upmedwinners2016 at gmail.com for any inquiries. On behalf of the UP College of Medicine Class 1991 and the UP Medical Alumni Society, we also thank our collaborator units, UP Manila Information Management Service, National Telehealth Center, UP College of Medicine Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, and Medical Informatics Unit, GOSD, ASCI, and Ms. Chalice Arhalo of the UP Manila National Valley Arcos. This is Dr. Jonas Del Rosario together with Dr. Ricky Pionco, Dr. Giselle Herbacho, and the UP Med webinar team closing this session. We hope you have learned a lot from today's webinar. Join us again in October 12th. Have a great week.